everybody and welcome to season 3 of Travel Stories with Marsh. If you love the world around you and you love exploring different landscapes, cultures, cuisines and cities, then you are in the right place because here every week I will be talking to an incredible travel enthusiast who will take us on a fascinating journey around the world by sharing their travel stories. On the episode today I have with me someone who is an explorer an adventurer and a storyteller who brings his travels to life through the various travel shows that he hosts and that broadcast around 123 countries around the globe Famously known as the guy in Dubai and the guy in the sky these are the television shows that he hosts Paris Norris joins me here in the studio today to talk to us about some of his most exhilarating travel stories Paris welcome to the podcast I have Thank to say I'm thrilled me. to go on some really adventurous journeys with you today. Yeah, there's a lot to talk about. Yeah, there is, right? Now, of course, you're an adventure buff and uh, you go around on various adventures around the world. But the one that really stands out is the one that you did last year, uh, which is the Pacific uh, Rowing Challenge which you completed. Now I know for a fact that the Pacific can be quite a beast. It harbors some of the most dangerous waters. So my first question is why? Why did you do it? Well, underlying everything that I do is this sense of adventure and fun and mm-hmm. wanting to discover things and push myself. There's nowhere on this planet that's as um derelict Mm-hmm. as the Pacific Ocean. Yeah. It's the um the most derelict place on the planet is Point Nemo which is in the Pacific Ocean. We were a bit north of that. But um the challenge itself was something that only 82 people in history had ever done. Um, Amazing. Where you know 700 people have been to space, 12,000 have climbed Everest. Mhm. Don't test me on the numbers but something like that. Um and you know quite a few people have rode across the Atlantic Ocean. Right. So the Pacific Ocean was a bit untouched mm-hmm. and the destination was this beautiful island called Kauai mm. which is like a dream island. It's mm-hmm. where they filmed Jurassic Park. I thought this this is going to be an incredible adventure. Topped by the fact it was three friends of mine. But I thought, you know, this is going to be fun to do together. And those were many days out in the ocean, right? Through days and nights and through choppy waters and what have you. So, uh there there must have been a lot of preparation that required for you to go on that journey. Choppy waters is an understatement. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> 40 sure. foot waves in a storm is is oh, what Lord. it really was. Oh, But yeah, Lord. the um like we were there for on the water for 39 days. Mhm. We were rowing 24 hours a day mm. as a team. Um that was 2 hours rowing, 2 hours resting mm. individually. So that would usually be 12 hours rowing each per day. Uh but then we would donate some extra hours so sometimes we were rowing up to 14 hours a day each. Mm. So there was a huge amount of physical training that went into that. But then yes, we had to weather in this scenario it was two storms. Mm. One of them hit land and got a name called Storm Calvin and the other one never hit land no one ever knew about it but it was incredibly terrifying if you were four guys in a in a small rowing boat and we had to be prepared for that in terms of what do we do in a rescue scenario but there is a lot there is a lot in this whole journey and of course i mean it's it's quite evident that you're an adventurer and that is how you you kind of navigate your your life around in this world and this is the way you live you know you like to live your life through adventure and you've surely been on so many adventures but particularly today um what i would like to know and to begin the podcast is where will you be taking us on a journey are you taking us on another adventure are you taking us rowing sailing where are you taking us Well, I've just come back from Jordan. Why don't we talk about that? Let's talk about Jordan. Yes. Cuz Jordan is a Jordan's a fantastic country. We're mm-hmm. based in the UAE right now. Mm-hmm. So it's a 2-hour flight. Mm-hmm. It's not far. Yeah. Um it's not an expensive flight and tourism is down right now because in the neighboring countries they're having all sorts of right. political conflicts. Right. Jordan itself is not in a conflict and so it's perfectly safe to go to, but tourism is down and it's nice to go to countries when they're not in at that popular moment because people are more 
open to meeting you. People want to help. People are welcoming of your tourism and and your business. And there's just a, a, a sweetness. Mm. Um, every single person I met in Jordan was seriously, seriously kind and mm. nice. Mm. And it was a very, you know, one thing I'll go away saying is, you know, that they're a great bunch of people, you know, very genuine. Um, but it was great. You know, you can visit places like Petra and the Dead Sea, Wadi Rum, Akaba, where I did some of the best scuba diving I've ever done um, in the Red Sea. And I did all of those things with not really any tourists around. Um, uh, I, I, there were tourists at Petra because that's always a tourist environment. But let's say there are a thousand people there. Mm. If you go when the, when tourism is at its height, you can have 10,000 people there. So, you know, apart from Jordan being this kind of ideal place to visit right now because, you know, they need the tourism. It's also, of course, the time of the year is important when you visit. But why else do you think Jordan is special? I mean, apart from the people being so nice, uh, the food, I'm sure, is great too. Give us something else about Jordan that you discovered and which stayed with you and you would go back there for. Well, there's a lot of variety there. Mm. So I went for four days and in four days I managed to see a man where I went to a Roman theater. Mm -hmm. um, I went to uh, the Dead Sea, did some floating, which was great. Mm -hmm. uh, Petra uh, did scuba diving in Akaba where we, there's this thing called the military museum where I was swimming underwater where all these tanks and fighter jets and planes that are down there mm -hmm. and swimming. That was very unique. And then Wadi Rum, which is uh, this sort of beautiful part of the desert. That was a lot to do in four days. Mm. And, and you know, it's not a hu huge country, so you can do it. Um, but there was a load of places that I would like to have gone where I didn't have time to go. And there's many, many uh, layers to it. So there's a lot of variety within a fairly small country. Right. So a bit of everything in Jordan. So that was that was a nice little journey into Jordan. Now, yeah. you know, you travel around with your uh, travel shows. You go to various parts of the world and you've experienced so much. So in your travel experience and in this journey with the travel shows that you've been doing, which has been the most interesting part of the world for you and why? Definitely the Middle East. It's been the most interesting, conflicting vibrant uh, region for as long as civilization started mm -hmm. and civilization started mm -hmm. in the Middle East. So much to see and do. You know, the food is fantastic and 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 it's interesting because you've got so many different types of food mm. from Morocco to Muscat. So tell me what has been your craziest adventure so far? Oh, well, it has to have been the row. It has to be the row. I mean, the, the row was the biggest, probably the most dangerous, the most... What was the craziest thing that happened? And now when we say the row, we'll be obviously talking about the Pacific Row Challenge, right? So what has been the most crazy thing that happened during those 39 days that you were out in the sea? Um, well, there were, you know, crazy things happened every day mm -hmm. and it was just part of the, part of what we were doing. One of those was when we um, got a notification on a piece of equipment we have called an AIS which tells us when we're on the same collision path as another boat. Now, this piece of equipment goes off all the time when you're when we were training off the coast of Dubai because there's boats everywhere. Mm -hmm. But when you're in the Pacific, you don't see any boats. Um, we saw five in the whole 39 days. So this piece of equipment goes off, and it was the first time it had gone off, and we were like, well, what's that about? And then they asked me to check, and we see there's a, a cargo ship, but it's about 20 miles away. And we're like, okay, no problem, no big issue, but we'll keep an eye on it. And it gets a bit closer. Um, and then as it's getting closer, we realize it's getting dangerously close. We need to get in contact with them, let them know we're here and let them know we don't have an engine and that we're a rowing boat because small boats need to get out the way of big boats, but we don't have an engine. So actually- You can't get out that fast. We can't get out. Yeah. So, so if it's coming at us, it's faster than us. So- Oh my God. So we had to radio to it. And now I look back over the video footage, I realized we gave it the wrong instruction. Um, so when it was just going to sort of miss us like this, it turns and now it's dead on and it's 800 meters away from us, getting bigger and bigger and bigger. And all of a sudden the, the tone in our voice changes to something very urgent, which was 
get the flares, get the life jackets, let's go. You know, like, and it, um, so jump off the boat. It was like, it was a situation when it was a situation like that that you might have to jump off the boat, jump off the boat. And just to put that into perspective, we're 1,000 miles away from land. So that's three days. Uh, we're out of US waters. So uh, rescue's not coming. Life jackets are not just around. They, we, they're stowed away because we don't always need them. Um, the water was about 10 degrees Celsius. So we would have got hypothermia in half an hour. We would have died of hypothermia in four hours. And if, a, and if the boat did hit our boat, it would be smashed and our life raft would have been spewed somewhere it was windy as well so anything would have been would have gone so and this cargo ship had no idea that you guys were out there on the ocean no idea oh my God. you couldn't see us it was so high up you know these things are very yeah. very high um and i'm looking at it just getting bigger and bigger it actually felt like the boat was attacking us because i thought we'd radioed to it so it knows we're here why is it coming dead at us but actually we've given it the wrong the wrong instructions so this thing's getting closer and closer and closer um and we got back on the radio. We said, we're, we're now directly in front of you. Please turn to your, your port side. And it turned and it missed us by about 150 meters. We watched this giant ship bigger than the Titanic go past us. Wow. And, you know, that to us at that time, it was just, it was cool. But it was like just another crazy thing that was going on. The, the, within the next 24 hours, we got a hole in the boat. Um, we the, the first 10 days, I remember it being the, I call it the first 10 days of hell in my, in my mind. Yeah, it felt like the ocean was this big monster just waiting. Just to swallow like, you yeah. down. And it was just like, make a mistake and you're all mine and I'm going to eat you. And it was just, it was these waves. On day three, the waves had started undulating to 40 foot and they were coming at us from the side, which could capsize your boat. Um, and it was like that for, well, until day 11. And then day 11 came and it was almost like um, magical. It was as so flat it, it took as you a pond. 10 days to kind of ease down and settle in and kind of then perhaps enjoy it a bit. Well, the we journey. were in a storm for the first 10 days. So so it it wasn't normal circumstances, mm. but we didn't know any different. Um, we did know that the currents in the first... We thought it was going to be like, we were hoping it was going to be four days. Mm. We're going to be really tough and we've got to try and break out of that. But that four days was 10 days. And then um, day 11, we had, we, it was like a, a pond, like glass. And the sun came up, it was beautiful and we could wash ourselves. And this is far into the Pacific. What, yeah, the, the, you couldn't imagine that. 11. It was so still, like wow. dead still, like, 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 like a pond still right in the middle where just... But that must be beautiful. Just the day before it was rocking yeah. out. Oh, it was absolutely beautiful. I got yeah. these. So that has obviously been your craziest adventure. Now let's talk about uh, destinations. You know, you've been around so many places. Which has been your favorite uh, destination so far? And why do you love it so much? Unfortunately, I feel everywhere I go, I'm like, I love that place. Yeah. I want to go back. It's amazing. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Like, honestly, I feel like that whenever I travel. Um, ones that stand out to me, um, uh, Turkey. I've mm -hmm. only ever been to Istanbul, but I've been many times. Okay. And there's a lot more in the rest of Turkey, which I love to discover. Mm -hmm. Amazing food. I mean, I love the food. I love the cats. <laughs> okay. Nobody said that before. I love the cats. The cats in Istanbul. Well, the, the animals, because they're kind of semi-stray in the sense that they're stray, but everybody looks after them. Okay. And so they kind of take ownership of like a shop. And they'll just be like, this is my shop and I'm going to guard it. It's and interesting. Yeah. It's, yeah. That's very sweet. Um, incredible history, beautiful scenery. Okay. Well, let's talk a little bit about some bloopers, travel bloopers. You know, things right. happen when we travel. And, you know, I have changed this question around a little bit because a lot of people don't want to talk about places that they have had bad experiences in or travel experiences, you know, because so many things happen. You might lose your bags. Uh, you might miss a flight. You know, these things happen. But, you know, I want to change this question around a little bit and ask you, has there been an experience throughout your travel life which has taught you something that... Um, you know, which has taught you something, like something that you shouldn't do or something that you must be equipped with um, when you travel. You know, what have you learned uh, through a blooper in your travel life? So, in fact, I just said that Istanbul, Istanbul was one of the, the 
top places. But the first time I went there, I got ripped off and conned by someone. So the thing was, is I, I, I had a day there the first time I went and I was like, right, I want to see everything. Got in a taxi and said, take me to the, the mosque. And he said, which mosque? I'm like, the big mosque. He's like, which big mosque? I'm like, I don't know. I thought there was like a big mosque. He's like, yeah, there are. There's many of them. I'm like, oh, well, what's like the yeah. one? He's like, we have many, the ones. Yeah. Which, so anyway, when we finally got around to figuring out which was the mosque I wanted to go to, it was obviously the, the blue mosque. Yeah. Um, uh, I went there and as soon as I get out the the taxi, you know, someone says, hello, my friend, I'll, uh, I'll take you. And, and I kind of did want a tour guide because... I'm only there for a day. Mm. And anyway, I, I kind of figured as this guy's talking, I'm, uh, I kind of figured, okay, I can see this. I'm going to get conned here somewhere. Mm. You know what I mean? It, mm. it just felt like that. And I remember as I'm sort of doing social media, as I'm going around, I'm even sort of saying by social media, I'm not so sure about this guy. I think he might have something up his sleeve. Um, so I, I knew it was coming, right? Yeah, yeah. Uh, and it did. Um, and, you know, they tried to sort of con me out of more money and it ended up, you know, with the sort of big... so isn't it funny the one that is your favorite destination is also the place where you had a blue yeah, yeah exactly yeah and it was a negative experience and yeah. that it didn't have to be like that no, which i like because that didn't stop you from choosing istanbul as one of your favorite places yeah. right so that's interesting well it it did make me think like okay be a bit more careful but like you know um what about hidden gems i mean you go to all these different corners of the world surely there must be you know um some hidden gem that you want to talk, tell us about okay oman mm -hmm. oman's a fantastic one a lot of people uh don't venture into oman even from here and we're right next to it so oman has loads it's you know everything that i said about jordan i can say about oman oman is fantastic is a little hidden gem tucked away in the Middle East people don't know much about. Absolutely. That is true. That is so it's true. It's politically so, neutral. Yeah. The people are the kindest. It's traditional Arabic culture, yeah. beautiful landscapes, wadis, mountains. And so easy to get to and so easy to just be there and ha has some really incredible places to stay as well. And yeah. the beaches are just so pristine yeah. as well. But, you know, again, I want to again talk a little bit about adventure because, you know, all the listeners who are out there listening and just looking up to you about you know regarding all these different adventures that you've been on so as an adventurer and having been on so many different adventures um if somebody is listening right now who is seeking out to go on an adventure which adventure do you highly recommend that one must definitely do in their lifetime well i'm not going to encourage them to row across the pacific no i, <laughs> I don't think you should but but i would highly recommend and maybe i don't know if it really classes as a hidden gem mm -hmm. but hawaii is incredible the underwater world of hawaii and i guess you could say this about all the pacific islands mm. is incredible i did um a beautiful night dive where they bring out the manta rays and when i say they bring them out they put lights under the water in the sea on the big island in kona and the lights attract the plankton and the plankton is what the manta rays come and eat. And these manta rays are five meters wide. They're beautiful animals. And they and you just sit there and wait for them and they come and they just swim around you. And it's absolutely magical. And Hawaii is full of underwater adventures like that. I also had what might seem the most insane thing I've ever done, but actually it was quite peaceful. I swam with tiger sharks. Um, as far as you are away from me was a five meter tiger shark with a mouth that could have snapped me in half. Um, and it was funny because I'd rode for 39 days to get there. Mm -hmm. Every moment pe petrified of sharks coming in, uh, you know, tormenting our boat or, you know, something like that. And here and you are right next to it. And there I am. You see, once I had arrived in Hawaii, someone said to me, oh, you should come swimming swimming with sharks with us. And I was like, what, you mean in a cage? And they're like, no, 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 we swim with sharks. I'm like, but how? The, 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 I mean, small sharks. No, 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 tiger sharks, great whites. I'm like, but surely that's going to go wrong sometime. And they're like, no, you see, sharks are quite passive. Uh, and when you're with an expert, they can tell you if they are aggravated. If they're aggravated, you wouldn't enter the water. And you can tell by 
the way that their pectoral fins are and the way that they're swimming. But if they're docile like they usually are, um, they're not really interested in humans. And there's a way that they teach you to behave around a shark, which is, first of all, stay calm and relaxed, which is a bit difficult, right? Yeah. And it's harder knowing that if I don't stay calm and relaxed, it's going to smell my fear and want to eat me. So you've got to stay calm and relaxed and stay looking at it eye contact because then they consider you to be potentially a predator and they they they're not going to come and uh, so and you did this in hawaii yes did that in the north shore of oahu and so hawaii itself you think and you recommend is a, is a great adventure and people should do it once in their lifetime oh, yeah once in your lifetime for sure and i'm glad that i managed to spend two months there you know of course you now hawaii is the place which you highly recommend that people should do once in their lifetime it's a great adventure there but um what about that one place that you would highly recommend that anyone should visit in 2024 specifically this year i mentioned already i've already spoken about me going to jordan mm -hmm. the reason why that's important this year is um over 70 percent of jordanians are palestinians from the west bank um it's interesting to talk to people um, when there's so much going on in the world with people having such large opinions and influence taking place out of our control mm. uh, that, it, you know. Um, that yeah. is so nice, Paris. I really like that. You're yeah. saying like so many Palestinians are there. So by you visiting Jordan as a country, you're actually contributing well, perhaps contrib to the econ economy yeah. to take care of these Palestinians who are now... Uh, who have migrated to Jordan yeah. in a way, in a way, and Not, also to listen to conversations, perhaps. The conversations, I think that's more what it's about. So, I mean, we had a, a couple of nice experiences that happened. Uh, I went into a shop. I wanted to buy a, a scarf. You know, it's, mm. I guess, the what people consider to be the Palestinian scarf. But I, want, I was in Jordan and I wanted to buy a Jordanian scarf. Um, so I wasn't buying it for a political reason. I was buying it because I was uh, abroad. Um but the lady was from Gaza. And I don't know too many people from Gaza because it's not a place that people can really get out. Um, she was the sweetest. And I, I thought, I need to buy this scarf for her. Uh, for, sorry, for me and for my, my girlfriend that I was with. I'm going to buy her scarf because um, this lady I want to help. And very, very sweet. And by having those connections, when the people that... Um, are being represented in the news mm -hmm. under her name, um, are being represented in every way. Uh, I think it's important to know who those people are. So, of course, Jordan is that country that you highly recommend. For, for this year, you, for you this said year, 2024. For 2024, definitely, for so many reasons. Yeah. For so many reasons for this year, it's very important that we visit Jordan. Now, finally, um, as we come to the end of the podcast, uh, what is next on your bucket list? Where are you going next? What is there that you want to tick mark? Well, um, I'm going to do another challenge. Mm-hmm. Not announced it yet, so we can... You can talk about it, but... Well, no, I can't talk about it. We'll call this an announcement if you like. Okay, so okay, go for exclusive. it. exclusive. Me and my buddy James, mm. who is uh, a friend from school, um, decided we're going to run seven marathons in seven days consecutively on seven continents. Wow. So it is a, a, a mash of travel, starting off in Antarctica, a place I've never been before, um, going to Cape Town, then mm -hmm. to Perth in Australia, then to Istanbul, as I mentioned before, mm -hmm. one of my favorite places, which is in both Asia and Europe. So we'll right. do a marathon in each over two days. Then we fly to Cartagena in Colombia and finish off in Miami, Florida. And I'm But filming... this is not over seven days, is it? Yes. So it'll be one week, one week of travel. Wow. So the only way it's possible is to actually rent the plane yourself, right? So we're, we're renting right. a, a private... Uh, a plane to do it there's more than just me and james doing it there's mm -hmm. a group of us and um okay otherwise i'm coming off a little bit like, <laughs> I'm like okay <laughs> where is this going here. trust me things are not that great with the tv business <laughs> i was like <laughs> okay yeah. then no, no, it's uh uh there'll be a group of us so i mean that's incredible but, that, but, that's... but it's customized flying because we have to sleep on the plane eat on the plane 
Um, so I, you are taking adventure to a whole new level, my friend. Yeah. yeah. Well, so the sad thing is uh -huh. some of these places I've never been to before and I'm literally going to get out, run a marathon. And get into the plane global, again. And get in the plane and go. But what we are going to do, we're going to make uh, a travel show out of it. Mm -hmm. Now, I may only be there for a day, but my camera guys can be there before me. Right. And um, we want to film a bit of a destination piece. And well, that's that's really fascinating. I mean, seven continents and seven days and then doing the adventure that you're doing. Um, very, very, very ambitious of you. And yeah. I wish you all the best. I hope it goes off really well and you, you know, think of more adventures. And I really, really wish you all all the very best in your coming journeys. Thank you so much for joining me on the podcast today. It has been surely an exhilarating ride with you. Thank you. I've really been, uh, really enjoyed being on your podcast. Thank you, Paris. Thank you everyone for joining us today. I hope our conversations have fueled your wanderlust and inspired you to explore the world in new and exciting ways. Please don't forget to hit that subscribe button if you haven't already and let us know what you thought of today's episode. Until the next time, safe travels and keep exploring.